Oh, hello, everybody. Welcome to Nomen Art Jam. Uh, my name is Josh Herpin. Welcome to the stream. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and add Alex to our stream today. It's just going to be the two of us, but we're going to be making some stuff. Alex, I have no idea what I'm going to make today. Do you have any um, idea what you're going to make? I don't. <laughs> awesome. I yeah. Don't Today's going to be a, a free form yeah. stream. Free range. Yeah. I think uh, I'm, you know, after the last week of looking at all the NFT sites and learning about that world, it's mm -hmm. uh, my brain is full of a lot of weird stuff. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Yeah. A lot of insight yeah. you probably learned, though. Uh, yeah, it's been super interesting. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, clearly it's the, the fine art slant is, is big right now. Sure. And so I yeah. think, you know, like the, the pack sale, I guess, is ending today on Nifty Gateway. Oh, interesting. Who's an artist I'd never heard of until, you know, a couple of weeks ago with this whole, whole NFT thing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it looks like he's made about 30 or $40 million in the last two days. Wow. That yeah. is I know so much. It's insane. He, yeah, he's got a, a, a pixel for sale. It's a, pixel? A, a one one by one gray pixel. Like actually one pixel or is it just like a big square? Yeah, it's it's as far as I understand, it's a one by one gray pixel. And the current bid right now is at about 1.35 million. Oh. So who knew? who knew that's all? So take that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. CG artists. All, all we needed to do was just uh, make a one by one pixel. Yeah, that's, yeah. He, you know. he, I mean, he came up with some clever thing in there where it's like you have to buy this cube. Okay. And the more cubes you buy, then you can redeem those cubes for an NFT. And the really NFTs deep. you can redeem them for. It's like if you have five cubes, you get this one. If you got ten cubes, you get this one. So those cubes are fifteen hundred dollars each, and he sold twenty five thousand of them. So that's about thirty five million dollars. I mean, that's uh, that is a lot. That is a lot, a lot, dude. So I don't, you know, but that's the fine art world. You know, I've never professed to really understand the fine art world. Sure. Um, it's uh, so it's it's entertaining because I've always found the fine art world to be interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not what I personally am into from an art perspective. You know, I've always been sure. into lowbrow art and comic book art and fantasy and sci-fi and obviously all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I've never, I've been able to ignore the fine art world because it's always been like a gallery thing. Yeah. And now, now with the NFT thing, they're like, they're crossing over because, you know, these NFT sites launch and then, mm -hmm. You know, we see people as a CG guy because he uses Cinema 4D and does mm -hmm. these 3D images and the everydays. So we see him as kind of like one of us from that perspective. And he had that huge $69 million sale. Sure. So then it kind of, I think, made everybody in our community feel, oh, we're all welcome now in, in the fine space. art space. Yeah. And so you see people making accounts on Super Rare and Nifty Gateway and and uh, OpenSea and Rarible and all these different places. And ultimately there's a couple artists that are doing all right. Mm -hmm. But obviously if you really see what's trending at these sites like Nifty Gateway, Super Rare Foundation, it's very fine arty. Mm. You know, Pac makes a lot of spinning cubes that he right. sells for a lot of money. So it's, it's, it's uh, on the one hand, it's, it's fascinating to see digital artists making money. And on the other hand, it's uh, I think a little like a lot of people are just don't know what to make of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting the like the creation of a like a microcurrency that idea mm -hmm. of like purchasing this gets you this and that gets you this. That's really interesting. Right. Uh, that idea is interesting, but I don't know if I would pay $15,000 for a spinning cube. No, I mean it's 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 so. it's Obviously, the kind of people that are dropping all that money are wealthy, you know, and, uh, you know, like, you know, VR Aukus just said Beeple's huge sale seems a bit weird because the buyer was heavy into the NFT space. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I think Meta Kovan, who I think is the name of the person who bought Beeple's piece, is obviously uh, hyping up the space by dumping all of that money. So it's a little self-serving. Um yeah. So I still think, you know, digital artists deserve the respect that traditional artists get. And yeah, I think that agreed. that's what 
this movement is trying to accomplish. And so whether or not money is going into the hands of people that are already wealthy, some of that money is going into the hands of artists. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Vitaly sold a piece for 80 grand or something like that. And that's awesome because Vitaly is amazing and, and deserves it. Raphael Lacoste is an amazing art director. He's art director mm -hmm. to the Assassin's Creed games. He's doing really well. Pascal Blanchet, who's an artist that I've loved since like the 90s, totally. is doing well. So it makes me happy to see artists that we know that are doing well. But then I see other artists that are putting stuff online and not getting any bids who deserve mm -hmm. it. Right. So, uh, so yeah, it's, 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 it's so fascinating that it's taken up a lot of my space because <laughs> there hasn't been like, a, you know, these like new things that come out of nowhere that are kind of these uh, paradigm shifting moments uh, don't happen all that often. And clearly True. this could all go away and we might not be talking about this anymore in a year. It might yeah. not be NFTs. It might become something else that obviously uses less energy or whatever, but sure. But it is uh, fascinating. It's definitely, yeah, it is a, a you know a historic, I think, thing. And that's part of why it can absorb so much of your, your because you want to learn about it and know about it. I think that's really interesting that you, that there's so much happening there. Yeah. And, and it's, it is cool for discovering artists. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, if you go to, if you go to foundation and, or super rare and you scroll while, you know, for me, most of what I see isn't my taste. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally or several times I've come across artists that I didn't know about that yeah. whose stuff I really liked. And so it, right. it's uh, that I wouldn't find on art station, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning yeah, yeah. people that are from a different space doing work that isn't really our sort of fantasy sci-fi scene. It is more arty, but, uh, but ultimately uh, still using 3d tools and, you know, a lot of, a lot of cool stuff. So I, I think it's been, I think it's been fascinating. Yeah, so, um, it's definitely been interesting. Watching. Nice. Uh, it's got some greetings from the UK. Hello. Looks like we're getting some hellos here. Hi, Alex and Josh. Alex F1. Hello. Uh, let's see what else we got. Hello, legends. Hello, goosebumps. I hope you're that you're R.L. Stein. One of my, I remember reading so many goosebumps novels when I was younger. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I had another series of books that were called Twilight, but not related to the Twilight with Kristen Stewart. I was going to was gonna ask you. Yeah. No, it was a series <laughs> of horror novellas. They were short, like maybe a hundred pages each. And there was, mm -hmm. I think, I, I still have them, like forty of them. Mm -hmm. So I was reading them when I was like eleven. So they're horror stories, but the series was called Twilight. Okay. So, but yeah, not related at all to the. Uh... That's funny. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I'm going to start sculpting in ZBrush today. I'm okay. Show you. I'm going to use this planar head that I use all the time. I'm going to start doing this a little bit. I'll probably just explore cool. some faces or something. So I'm going to try. We were talking about this the other day, additive versus subtractive. I think I'm going to try to start out with the sculpt being more subtractive. Normally, I would start like blocking out. I want to try something like different in my workflow today. Normally, cool. I would like start building out like the shape this way. Mm -hmm. Right, and you know, nose and whatever. Today I'm gonna to try the reverse. So I'm gonna try carving in and seeing if my process is different. Just, just something new. Oh. So we'll cool. see how it goes. Let's see, what am I gonna do? Uh, let's see, well, I've never started with that head that you start with. I could always, that's in here yeah, try somewhere. It. Under projects, uh, hit lightbox, go projects, um, head planes. Project head planes. I'm looking and I'll eventually find it. Should be near the top there left. It is. There it is. Female, male. And then they're just 256 or 128, basically the size of the Dynamesh because it's still a Dynamesh object. Got it. I like using this thing a lot because it's just like simple to use. Like it's uh, flip these around. There we go. Um, it has such a strong foundation. Like you know, sculpting with planes is such like a a thing, right? That you can learn kind of as a as an introductory For concept. Sure. I mean, John Brown has students make those planar oh, heads. Yep. I was touring the campus today, and I think that's. Uh, 
interesting to be back there and been back there in so long. And uh, we went into the sculpture room and it was like, oh, look at all this stuff in here. Like look at all these cool sculptures. So maybe that's where I'm just wanting to do some sculpting today. Cool. I'll, I'll play with this head since I, I usually I've always started from a sphere, but I guess uh, no reason to start with this guy. It's not cheating. It's not cheating starting with a base mesh. Oh, by the way, uh, speaking of things to start point, have you seen, uh, have you launched Bridge today? I have Magus not. No. Here, I'm going to launch it. There's a new update today. Okay. I'm launching it. Yeah. And because uh, I saw it on uh, Instagram. But yeah, I guess the uh, meta human stuff is now in Bridge. Oh, wow. So if you look on the left, it now says meta humans. Uh huh. Yeah. I'm popping you up here. There we go. So, yeah. So, these, uh, so it's got 58 preset meta humans characters that are now in Bridge. Oh, wow. And supposedly, you can export them to Unreal or Maya. Can. So they're all presets, though. It looks like you can't. Um, so well, I guess them. you can you can now sign up for early access to MetaHumans Creator. So I signed up mm -hmm. this morning, but I, I don't oh, have nice. it. Um, and so here, there's a button that says Start MHC, uh, but uh, which will do nothing. And then I've been trying because I've got the updated plugin and Maya launched, uh, but when I click download, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it's it's something that just became available today. So oh, wow. I'm curious. Yeah. I assume that these are all presets where you could open them in MetaHuman Creator and adjust them. And then I'm just curious when mm. if it says that they can go to Maya, like what they're gonna come into Maya as. Like are they gonna be rigged? Are they gonna be, you know, what that'd be cool. How is you know, I assume all the hair and stuff is gonna be done via cards. You know, I guess, I mean, it says down here, the MetaHuman, this MetaHuman uses grooms only available at LOD zero and one requiring a higher spec machine. That's kind of vague. Okay, yeah. Um, but yeah, if, if I click on one of these dudes and like, it doesn't let me change the resolution. So I don't know, it's it's something that was just- Does it give you like more. a file format to export as? Uh-uh. <laughs> yeah, because for assets and stuff, you have all these settings for download. And here, if I go to download settings, it's, uh, I mean, it's got your texture and model settings. Mm -hmm. And nothing in here implies anything other than it just being a textured model. It's like so, a Z tool, though. Uh, well, you can specify for anything in Megascans. It's 3D if you want the source Z tool. Oh, that's Megascans fascinating. Tool. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. And, you should try uh, to download a Z tool and we'll see what it does. Like, but yeah, but I've, I've, I've tried clicking the download on button on these and then oh, they don't do anything. Nothing starts. Yeah, yeah. So oh, gotcha. Maybe uh, hopefully that gets whatever that is. Yeah. But they just this update just went live today. Hmm. But it's That's interesting. Cool thing. We have so, so yeah. much stuff coming out all the time. It's always interesting to see what what ends up what cool things are happening. Like Surprise! It's metahumans is sort of here. Yeah, for, I mean it's uh, ultimately there's always something new. Mm -hmm. Yep, one of my dogs is having a bad dream. <laughs> it's Lobo. Ah, he's huffing and puffing while he's sleeping. <laughs> I always love watching dogs have dreams, especially the running dreams. Oh yeah, they do that. You've seen that uh, video online of the dog that's running in his sleep and then he wakes up and runs into yeah. the wall. <laughs> it's, so, it's so bad, but definitely still funny. I know. Well, I am not going to do the reverse carving thing that you're doing. I tried that like for five seconds, and I was like, "This feels so uncomfortable." Like, did you stop already? <laughs> yeah, <I did. laughs> that's funny. <laughs> it's like, uh, this is really awkward. Uh, I don't feel comfortable sculpting this way at all. Uh, somebody was asking, like, "Are you going to do it like marble?" And I was like, "Oh, that's a good idea." You know, like we talked about that last week. Like, oh, like you're sculpting from a block of marble or something. But I don't. I just. 
I just don't think I could. It's so hard. It's so difficult. Out a little bit. Uh, first time here, what are you two working from? We're both working from uh, some base meshes that are inside of ZBrush. You can actually go into your light box up top here and hit head planes. Uh, and there's some some tools that basically I'll go back in my timeline that look like this. So you can start from a, a strong, it looks like this in case you don't know. This is my screen. And this is Alex's screen over here. Um, so you can uh, start from something that's got a nice base mesh, good form. Uh, and then begin adjusting it as you see fit. But he said, where are you two working from? Oh, where? Oh, Los Angeles. I'm in Los Angeles right now. I am in Joshua Tree, near a big Just... national park and a big marine base. There's a marine base? Uh, exciting, because we get to see all sorts of cool helicopters and things fly around every week. Yeah, it's nuts. You know I those helicopters, the uh, Osprey? Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, those are really cool. I guess I didn't realize there was a uh, Marine base over there. It's supposedly the largest one in the United States. Really? Yeah. Wow. And they're always doing training exercises out there. And uh, there's a lot of munitions testing. So you can hear the bombs. It sounds like a subwoofer in the back. Like, seriously, like it's miles away. Really? And it wraps the windows. Yeah. Wow. Which is, uh, I just can't imagine what it sounds like there. Yeah. You know? is if you could hear it miles away, it's got to be loud, like really loud. So, but yeah, they've got this big uh, town they built called like Little Baghdad or something. <laughs> they do testing and, you know, so it's, I mean, Joshua Tree, where I am, is a very kind of like liberal town, but the next town over, 29 Palms, is a little bit more, you know, more on the right. Conservative. Yeah, just that's cool. You know. and yeah, that's a, I really had no idea. That's cool. Do you feel it, or is it just like, because sometimes you feel like the big subwoofer sounds? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not like a problem. It's just crazy at first. When I first heard it, I'm like, what is that phone that is yeah. happening? Yeah. And then, uh, and they, you know, all times of day, sometimes it's during the day, sometimes it's at midnight. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you're uh, 56, 97 miles away. Nice, Flake. Where are you at? Because <laughs> that would be. Uh, it could be a lot of different places. Let's see. Oh, we got the question already. What are our thoughts on Blender? This is like the, the question that comes up every week. Uh, thoughts on Blender, uh, best 3D free package out there. It's the best free one. Uh, got a lot of cool features in it. Definitely worth picking up if you want to learn 3D. And it seems like there's a lot of cool uh, things that they're always innovating with. So big fans, I don't know it myself. I thought about picking it up, but I think it's awesome. Yeah, somebody on uh, Facebook the other day has uh, said like, quote, I'm gonna learn Blender is like the new, I'm gonna start working out for 3D <laughs> artists. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, let's see, it's to St. Petersburg. Oh, nice. Oh, here we go. Uh, Alex, hello, we have an Alex in the in the first term. I was, he's this uh, question is from Alex in first term. He just started, so I just had class with him yesterday. Hello. Awesome. Uh, he's got a question, which is, uh, do either of us make use of tablets such as the Surface Pro or the iPad Pro? Mm -hmm. um, I use the iPad Pro for um what's the program procreate i use that one a lot but that's the most thing i use it for uh, he's also asking are they sufficient enough for the industry standard projects or are cintiqs and intuos the only way to go uh surface pros are i've used one before and i don't i personally don't think that they're necessarily strong enough to 
Uh, most of them aren't to handle high high res, you know, models or scenes or anything like that. You're going to need a stronger piece of hardware. Um, and iPad, you're not really able to use the iPad for most of the things that we're using. Like ZBrush, you can't use it for. Maya, you can't use it for. A lot of that stuff, you just can't really use it for. So, uh, can't really use that. And so you kind of either want to go with a Cintiq or an Intuos if you want a tablet or if you want like a, a screen tablet in instead. Uh, I use tablets. So I have um, an Intuos. I don't even know what this is. Intuos Pro. Intuos 5 is what I'm using right now. Using a Cintiq or using an... an a, a uh, I'm using uh, just a tablet. So, which... Uh, yeah, just the sort of medium Intuos Pro. And, uh, I mean, iPads are, are great for Procreate, and a lot of mm -hmm. concept artists are using them. And there's a, you know, app called Nomad Sculpt and another one called Forger on the iPad. And this guy, Glenn Southern, that did a Nomad Workshop title recently, he's been putting a lot of stuff on his YouTube page about Forger and Nomad. And they look pretty cool. But ultimately, and they're inexpensive, you know, compared to something like ZBrush. So I think for people who want to try out digital sculpting who haven't done them before, I think it's like 15 bucks for Nomad. Mm -hmm. So it's not free, but it's still pretty cheap. And not too bad for a full, it sounds like it's a full application at that point. Uh, question, are we kind of freestyling or are we uh, sculpting from reference today? We're both just kind of freestyling. Uh, yeah, no reference. Just uh, not quite sure. Just messing around. Just exploring shapes. Uh, using AstroPad with iPad and Windows, you can have the same features. Hmm, interesting. I did not know about AstroPad. Me either. What is AstroPad? I don't actually know. It looks like some sort of um, like maybe it's an app or something. It says it works great and still you basically your iPad will be portable and small on your desk. So maybe it works like as a tablet or something. So who knows? Hard to know. It seems cool though. Uh, I just saw your comment, Robo. Uh, let's see. When do I'm scrolling up to see what your previous one was? A question for both of you: When do you expect virtual production and real-time VFX will become the mainstream? Ooh, I don't know. I mean, I think there's virtual always gonna production. Be, yeah, I mean, it's it's that's not. It's still. It depends how you're defining virtual production, like stuff like The Mandalorian, where. You know, if virtual production means that you have a soundstage and the soundstage is a hybrid between live action and CG, then that, you know, that's already becoming mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, you know, it requires a stage and LED walls and that's expensive. So that's going to keep it from being super mainstream right. until LED walls become cheaper. Um, ILM has a new uh, video on YouTube that's really cool about uh, the virtual production for season two of The Mandalorian. Um, and they go pretty in depth talking about their system. It's really, really cool. Nice. Yeah, I think they they refer to it as stagecraft. So I don't know if it's like, because they're using Unreal, but it sounds mm -hmm. like they have some of their own software and that's also what they're kind of highlighting. So mm -hmm. it's hard to tell if it's like, just a public service video or a look at this awesome tech we're developing at ILM video. It feels like it's a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think virtual production is, is here to stay. Mm -hmm. I agree. And so therefore, you know, 3D wasn't mainstream when it, you know, started like you had Toy Story and then within, you know, four years you had a TV show. Remember Reboot? I was going to say it was probably a reboot. Yeah, like it didn't take that long for it to all of a sudden, like it's all about the cost of entry dropping. Mm -hmm. You still see virtual production in the way where it's kind of cameras tracking 
where they're pointing and then having the output being on another screen that's showing the real time environment there's that element but i think what you're saying is like that more you know extreme on steroids version of something that's for big budget movies and stuff uh i hear a lot of people talking about how they you know they are potentially working on that or you know productions are wanting to do that but i don't know uh I'm sure that there's probably also limited spaces right now that can do that. So I'm sure that'll just take some time for those that's to be built up as well. Yeah, for sure. But it's uh, really cool. Oh, did you see Meets' new music video? No, I haven't yet. Is it awesome? It really uh, is. It's very entertaining for uh, Pussifer. <laughs> oh, right. That's right. I saw him posting about it, but I haven't watched it yet. So yeah, Maynard post, posted about it, and then, uh, and then yeah, it went live uh, Monday. So it, it starts off live action, and then becomes a CG, and it's all Unreal, you know. Cool. So I mean, basically, it's uh, almost an entire music video made in Unreal. It's super trippy, very meets. It's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's eventually going to be. I don't know if it'll be the only way to work, but I think it will obviously be a very popular style of working that will be here to stay for a while. I just, I just think the combination of practical and practical and, and digital is such a powerful tool that is going to be used by so many people. And you're going to be able to get such better performances from actors. Have you I, saved? I, <laughs> I haven't saved yet, no. Are you saving? I'm saving. All right, cool. Oh, uh, I'll save one here. We'll just call this head one. Oh, I've already got that. Okay, I'll save something else. Head one. You can't name something head one. I, I have, and I did before <laughs> this. <laughs> I name things with a date. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Because then that way, at least I kind of know when it's from. Because like the actual date that's tagged on a file isn't always accurate, you know. Sure. Yeah. 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 You're like, oh, this is, oh, I edited this recently, and then you look at it, and you're like, no, this is very old, quite old. Uh, it sounds like Astropad is an app. Okay. So you kind of uh, it says you connect with wireless. It's interesting. Have we ever considered doing a Nomen event that focuses on Black, Asian, LGBTQ in the industry? Uh, that's something we should definitely do. And I, I think I recognize your handle. So um, we kind of been playing around with the idea of what we would do with more events. And we're always kind of exploring what new uh, new things could be. But yeah, I think that could be a cool event to kind of highlight the, those people. For sure. Of course. I mean, it's. Uh, I think that you know, we've talked about diversity a little bit on the stream and, you know, we have always had a very diverse population uh, at Nomen, just because I think the arts in general are a little bit more diverse than the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And so our student population uh, is inclusive of everyone and uh, all races, all ethnicities, all genders, all gender identities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've worked a lot with women in animation over the years just to make sure that we, you know, could try to support more diversity just with general gender because when Nomen opened, uh, the industry was like 90% male, which was a mm -hmm. problem. And, uh, and the student body at Nomen was also majority male. And uh, now that's changed to almost be 50-50. And so I think that we're also seeing the same uh, not just on gender, um, but with everything else uh, as time goes by. So yeah, I think doing an event to call that stuff is out is something we definitely uh, are interested in. Mm -hmm. I don't know where I'm going with, with this sculpt. I'm just kind of making shapes. I feel like it resembles for some reason a clown painting that I remember looking at. Like, remember the, you ever remember those velvet clown paintings? Uh, of course, they're horrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for some, I mean, it's the nose. There's something in this that uh, looks like that. Oh, yeah, no, I'm, I for sure have seen those. There are thrift stores everywhere. Yes, I, 
I always would purchase them as uh, white elephant gifts. I was about to say they make the best. Yeah, they do. <laughs> they really do. Exactly what you wanted for your kitchen, isn't it? Well, because everybody goes for them early because they're you wrap them and they're big. So it's like, oh, this is going to be something interesting. Either it's going to be something cool or it's going to be something not cool. Uh, I'm not a big clown fan myself, so but uh, it's it's always fun. It's, but there's there's usually one person who goes for it. It's like I'll take that thing. So, uh, yeah, that's I've never had a uh, velvet. Never seen that part? Uh, never had a velvet painting in general. Uh, no, no. I think I had one. When I was younger. I think it had a tiger on it. That was a whole wave, I guess, velvet paintings. That'd be so weird to paint on velvet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. Hey, you're new to the stream. What is this stream for? Uh, Art Jam is just a pretty casual stream. So we're going to be making stuff, talking about things. If you've got questions about what we're working on or our process in general, uh, just feel free to ask, and we'll, we'll answer best we can. Um, just kind of make stuff every week, and sometimes we have guests on. Sometimes we're just jamming and exploring ideas, and sometimes we start with no idea what we're doing, which is what we did today. Sometimes we have more specific projects that we're working on. So welcome to the stream. Uh, if you got any questions, let us know. Yeah, pretty casual. I always uh, like showing up to the stream and then asking Alex if he knows what he's doing today because I have no idea what I'm doing most of the time. So uh, it's nice to be in company. How are you liking sculpting with this base? Uh, it's saved a lot of time. It does, yeah. Like a lot. A lot of time. Yeah. You get straight what you want. Uh, which is... Uh... Great. So yeah, no, I'm definitely. I feel like it's like loose enough that you can make whatever you want, but it's also tight enough that it gives you a strong enough foundation that you don't have to build a ton on there. I, I, I really like it. It's probably my number one most used base mesh. I feel like this is starting to drift into a Kevin Bacon territory. okay with you have a favorite kevin bacon movie um hollow man flatliners <laughs> okay that's a good one yeah it is a good one actually not footloose no not footloose okay uh let's see uh hollow man was cool i guess I like Hollow Man. It's obviously weird, but I always, I just like the Invisible Man in general as like a character. Let's see. Trying to toot anyone's horn, but Demetrius Wilson was one of the most helpful and entertained teachers you had during the foundation. It'd be great doing a stream. That's good to know. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we've heard really great feedback about him, so maybe bringing him on for a stream or something like that would be great. Yeah, it's fun having guests on, so mm -hmm. we'll be down for that. Trimmers. Somebody says Trimmers. Trimmers is a classic for sure. What just happened to ZBrush? I can't. It's uh, acting funny. Time to what? save and reboot. Save as. Good idea. <laughs> what? Oh, I think some weird micro Windows ink crap is going on. Oh, that's always fun. Go away. What is that? How do I turn, turn off? How do I turn you off? <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, 
I think I just lost all pressure sensitivity. So we're dealing with the same thing at the same time. Same ZBrush issues. Windows Inc. What I do is I exit. I touch my background. That didn't fix it. So fascinating that we both lost, had issues at the same time. <laughs> uh, we're using the uh, base mesh that's... Uh, Josh uses a lot. Which is on yeah, the, it's uh, in the light box. Head, yeah, head planes, and yep. so it's right, right there. Go away. Zombie Pope, exactly. That seems okay. to be the direction I'm going. There was definitely a moment where it turned to the full front view, and I hadn't looked over for a second, and I was like, "Oh shit, it's a Pope!" Like. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they had a question for you probably about workshop stuff. Um, Ian McKaig did a course on storytelling a long time ago. Have you asked him to do new stuff or has he just left or doing something? Uh, we've been working with Ian uh, recently on uh, some new stuff. And so I can't say Ian's super busy, of course. And so uh, we don't have a specific release date for it. Um, but hopefully we will have new Ian McKaig stuff released no one workshop this year you and go. so it could be summer um but I, i'm honestly not sure so but uh stay tuned to social media i assume to see where you're if yeah i mean ian, ian is awesome of course of course and yeah. uh he's a cool guy and so talented and so inspiring and motivating and such a positive energy and mm -hmm. I mean, you really can't say enough positive stuff about Ian. Really? Uh, Sergio from Facebook, you're saying it'd be cool if we did a jam on hard surface modeling or something. Uh, we did one of those several weeks ago, maybe back in January with Paul Gabriel. So if you go back into our YouTube channel, you'll find the ZBrush art, art jam with Paul Gabriel is, is exactly, I think, what you're looking for. And he shows me a bunch of cool features and tips and ways to uh, use live booleans, to how to block out a mesh, do some Z modeler stuff. Uh, so check that one out if you want to check out that stream. In your opinion, what is the best render for Maya? You know, the one that you have access to are also similar these days, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Arnold uh, is fine, but its strength isn't necessarily GPU rendering, but it's a beautiful renderer. Um, I think if you're solo, um, like working on your own, you know, GPU renderers often are offer a lot of benefits just if you don't have a render farm and and you're you can accept the way that Octane or Redshift look mm -hmm. um so i use redshift um because as a person doing personal stuff at home the performance is amazing compared to arnold and v-ray um but really v-ray arnold redshift octane you'll you'll see beautiful images online from all of the renderers Doesn't seem like there's one that's like really dominating right now. Well, it, it I mean it's like it depends. Like if you you know in commercial production, you're going to see V-Ray everywhere. Hmm. You know, um, but uh, so V-Ray is still super popular. You're going to see fine. I don't know. I, I see all of them getting mentioned. You know, I mean, Maxon bought Redshift, so I'm not quite sure what that is going to mean mm -hmm. for the future of Redshift. Hopefully, something good. It's funny right. because like there's so many Cinema 4D artists on the NFT sites right now. Oh, it yeah. seems like they all use Octane. Really? But uh, but Maxon owns Redshift, so we'll see if that changes. Interesting.
paired with a 3090. Yeah, if you can get one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's that's the real challenge, isn't it, right now? I mean, you can get one on eBay for, you know, way too much money. Yeah, for like, what is it, double, triple the price? Yeah, it's, it's annoying. You heard about the, the render token that Otoy is working on? No. So there was a, at the sort of GTC conference this week, there was a panel and they were talking about it. So basically it's like uh, Otoy's render service where you buy tokens that are using the blockchain for rendering. Hmm. So I don't, I, I don't fully understand it, but basically it seems to be that, you know, there's so many GPUs that have been, that are out there that are not being used whether it's GPUs that were used for, bought for mining or GPUs that people have on their computers that are just not being used for anything at the moment. Right. Like your GPU is just sitting idle. So I think it's a way for people to uh, sell uh, time on their local GPUs. Interesting. Uh, so that people can render on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's while it, Otoy is developing it, the people who make Octane, I guess they're gonna support Redshift and other um, GPU renderers. Hmm. That's interesting. So it's some kind of blockchain crypto rendering solution, but I, I can't speak intelligently about it. I just I just saw uh -huh. a couple things online about it. Yeah, hmm. that's cool though. Uh, is it possible to sculpt in Maya without the need of Mudbox or ZBrush? Uh, yes, but you shouldn't. It's very time consuming and slow. Yeah, Definitely not recommended. The poly count, you know, like uh, Maya's viewport doesn't do great with heavy poly count counts. And so to be able to sculpt in Maya, like with the fluidity that you can in ZBrush, um, it's just not the same performance. So the brush tools in Maya are good for like general tweaking or blocking out like a base mesh like you could do, but for like detailed sculpting, you wouldn't really want to do that in uh, in Maya. Yeah, that's actually the sculpting tools in Maya have been there since version one. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that. it's. Yeah, ZBrush wasn't like the first program where you where the idea of digital sculpting with a tablet like started. It was just the performance in Maya was really bad. So what was unique about ZBrush was the fact that it could handle millions of polygons. Yeah, that was fast. Yeah. It's interesting. So yeah, it was uh, called Artisan now, but the original name for the sculpting tools in Maya before Maya was released was Jasper. Hmm. For some reason. Random Somebody's asking. Trivia. Yeah. Super random. I'm going to save again as my autosave came up. Uh, somebody was asking, they're in their first term at Noman. They're asking if they can uh, work study when the campus reopens in summer. Hopefully, cross fingers. When the campus reopens, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what it's for. Yeah, the intent is to get students on campus as soon as we uh, can do so safely and uh, per the state's guidelines. So just stay tuned, watch headlines that just have to do with any college in California, not just Noman, because we're all mm -hmm. kind of in the same boat. So if you see headlines in regards to like, you know, universities in California are reopening campuses, and that means Noman would be able to do that as well, you know, mm -hmm. so. It's it's coming, and uh, we're just crossing our fingers that it'll be for summer. Uh, what matte caps are we using? Mine is not a standard one. Yours doesn't look like a standard one. Mine is uh, not. I think I got mine from uh, ZBrush Central's matte cap downloader, or whatever it's called, but. I don't remember the specific one. I've named them where they were named Z one through seven. So Z 
I'm using Z1. Mine is from a guy named Ralph Stumpf, S-T-U-M-P-F. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and he's got some on ZBrush Central. And then uh, we had like a collection of matte caps from him that we were selling on Nomenology back in the day when mm -hmm. Nomenology was still a thing. And so that's where I got them. So I don't know if, you, if they're still available today anywhere. Probably search RS mat caps and see what you find. Yeah. Yeah, it was a collection of a whole bunch. So I have a few RS mm -hmm. ones in here. And uh, they're pretty neat. Yeah, I remember liking those quite a bit. The clay ones and that like sort of fiery one and like a Hulk one. And there's some cool ones from what I recall. Looks cool. Where is Nomen located? We are in the middle of Hollywood. Like pretty much in the middle. Yeah, right. <laughs> pretty much right in the middle. I think like if you pull up Google Maps and you find Hollywood, it's like in the text of where Hollywood is on the map. Where the map will actually say Hollywood. <laughs> ZBrush or Mudbox? ZBrush. Yeah, I never had a good sculpting feel inside of Mudbox. I know some people that have always preferred it, and then it definitely turned into a production, a more production tool, because it was turning into a really, uh, Mudbox is a very great texturing tool. Mm -hmm. um, but I was just never got the right feeling out of it from a sculpting standpoint. Yeah, I, I would not recommend anybody to use Mudbox for anything. Yeah, I, I almost see it as a dead product. I would agree. Yeah, I, it's not, I'm, I'm not a fan of that one. I, I question if they even have a dev team on it. <laughs> yeah, they might not. You know, it's uh, there's more interesting things happening and in, in with other software packages and, and ZBrush. You know, the guy who created ZBrush is still the owner and lead developer for ZBrush, and he's a genius. You know, Ofer. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why you keep seeing, you know, just con new features out of ZBrush constantly. Yeah, so, and they're always yeah. really innovative. Yeah. So I just think that uh, ZBrush is, uh, <clears throat> and the thing that's important to remember, is ZBrush is a, is a perpetual license that uh, is forever. Like you don't pay for upgrades, which other mm -hmm. software companies don't do, which is amazing. So if you bought ZBrush 10 years ago, you still get, all the upgrades for free. I did. So, so it is an investment, you know, to, to buy ZBrush for sure, but it's not like you have to pay that, you know, every year. And I think that's very cool of them because they could make a lot of money. I have a feeling if they just started charging for upgrades and uh, they, don't, they clearly don't, you know, they're not a big owned by some big billion dollar publicly traded corporation where everything is about the share price going up. Mm -hmm. So the fact that the like programmer still is the owner. Yeah. I think they just want to make cool tools for artists because, you know, Ofer is also an artist, mm -hmm. which is awesome. So he's like, he's making something for himself too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of not just ZBrush, but Pixelogic as a company. Mm -hmm. Uh, somebody is asking about software at Nomen. Uh, if, if you're still here, if you mind clarifying your question, uh, maybe you're asking what the software we're using is. We're using uh, ZBrush today, though. Somebody says this kind of looks like Channing Tatum. I'm assuming that's my side. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you ever used Topo Gun for Retopo? I have. I wasn't a big fan of it. I, I kind of just gravitated towards Quad Draw uh, once that got put inside of Maya or Polyboost or previous tools like that. Yeah, Zebras is also one of the cheaper programs out there. It's not wildly expensive.
I'm not even sure how much it is though. It's like eight hundred dollars or something. I want to say somewhere around that. I believe less. I looked, it was under a thousand. They do have a subscription model now, so if you wanted to just try it out for a little bit, you can. Um, you know, you know, you don't have to dive in fully. And if they have a, if you've never used it before, there's a free version called uh, ZBrush Core Mini, uh, which is much more limited than what we're both using today. Uh, but it you can play around and sculpt and, and make you know just experience the software at least what it's like to do digital sculpting and they have a version up from that which is called zbrush core and then they have just full zbrush have you uh printed anything lately I haven't recently uh i've been prepping to do some other stuff like that and haven't printed anything super recent. Um, I want to try around with some new resins again though, because that was what I was enjoying trying. I just got to figure out what I'm going to, what my next thing was going to be. I was going to do those arms of that IG-88. I ended up, use, I think I used the wrong paint on it. The paint that I bought was from a hobby shop and it said like it had primer and everything inside of it, but the paint started to bubble really oddly. And okay. then did I tell you that it started leaking everywhere? No. <laughs> okay. So I, um, I hollowed it out. This is, this is my theory, but essentially I hollowed it out. Uh, okay. so you use less resin, but the shell of, you know the the hollow, so the whole chest actually cracked. Okay. And and so like there was like let several divots in the design that kind of went in relatively deep, and some of those cracked open both in like hit the torso and in the chest piece, and okay. just sort of like a a gooey center started to emerge and like come out of the crack, but it was just uncured resin, uh, in on the inside because it it didn't it, UV light couldn't cure the outside, so it just started smelling again and then dripping everywhere uh so it's actually outside right now because i don't want it to be in the the uh in the space where i'm at um so I, that's what i'm trying to figure out is like it because i didn't hollow because because i did hollow it what did i do wrong with this thing so i'm trying to figure out like how i can make it how the next print won't have that issue but uh it definitely started creating some problems that I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like I was actually holding it up to show somebody on a stream mm -hmm. or a, a video call as we all do now. And all of a sudden it was just like my hand, like down the back of my hand was like run it, like was just resin running down my hand. And I was like, oh no, like what is happening here? Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's, that's why I haven't printed anything recently, but I def I'm going to try doing some, uh, unhollowed prints i realized that like the amount of resin i'm saving is specifically with the type of printer that we're using and the uh the cost of the resin is pretty cheap that i'm mm -hmm. only saving like a two dollars hollowing this thing out so i'll probably just not hollow out stuff Interesting thing that also happened when I hollowed it out, which was a problem that I didn't expect, was you're supposed to like dump it in either alcohol or in water to rinse it off. Right. But if it's hollow, it floats. And so you're trying to like get it to the bottom of this thing to like wash it off, but it won't fall to the bottom. And so you're having to like put something else on top of it to like keep it down there, which was also a really weird uh, thing that I had to do. So kind of just troubleshooting some unexpected things that have come up. That is the nature of new stuff and new yeah, toys. Yeah, exactly. I go, this is cool. Oh, it's leaking everywhere. What's happening? Uh, I do. I was thinking about printing a bigger one of these, though. Oh, the one that I did with Jared. I like this one quite a bit. So I was thinking about printing some a bigger one of this uh, or something like this that would be fun. Uh, 
Uh, Matthew's asking, at what point do you add a mouth cavity? Is it that during a sculpt or during the remesh? Uh, the, that's tough. For me, I usually would do it after like the sketch of the sculpt. Um, you know, something where it's like I'm, I'm a little further along and I want to maybe show the teeth or open the mouth or do an expression or something. Um, sometimes I'll use a base mesh that already has that built in. And so then you don't really need to, too. Only when you need to. Uh, for... Disappear for a sec. I need to go check on the uh, ah, plumber. Let's see. No worries. All right. I'll be right back. Mm -hmm. I'll mute you. All right. Any other questions from the chat? Just go ahead and let me know. Somebody saying there needs some more uh, ZBrush in your pipeline. ZBrush is like my favorite for sure. It's definitely one of those things that I really enjoy using. Uh, it's just easy to easy to use. It's fun to use, and it's kind of become my sketching tool. Uh, we were, Alex and I were chatting about this the other day, but you know, I'm just enjoying, or I do enjoy. It's just using it as a, a tool to sketch and to ideate. And I don't do a lot of stuff in sketchbooks, but I do folders and folders and folders of just different sculpts that I've started, but I kind of throw them away, you know, when I'm done because I don't I don't really have a need to continue with them or I've gotten the idea out and it just is uh doesn't feel like it's gonna go where go anywhere or I know where it's gonna go and I'm not interested in exploring that space. So it looks like Alex has his, uh, <laughs> right as somebody was saying, his, his sculpt is getting really cool. I agree. And then his ZBrush uh, screensaver came on, and we got a beautiful shot of Carnage and then a piece of uh, rotor up top. So that's cool. Probably going to finish this one and just move on to another one. This is, in case you, you don't know, uh, you, most artists have a tendency to sculpt either themselves or some just shapes that they're commonly used to. This is the head. I feel like I have sculpted this head a thousand times because when I don't sculpt with any reference, it always looks it always looks like this, and that's really odd to me. But I think it's really also interesting at the same point. Oh, that's just Jackie Chan. Somebody made a great Jackie Chan up there. Look at that. That's super cool. <laughs> and there's a Tom Holland. We're just getting a bunch of celebrity uh, likenesses right now on the stream from the, the uh, screensaver. Yeah, I always sculpt this head. So now I'm like, like I wonder. I'm going to pull it up because I don't want to see what happens. But if I come over here and I go to... I'll say I'll save this first. I'll show you exactly what I mean and see how accurate I am or if it's just my brain thinking I did this. Does clay sculpting help before using ZBrush? Yes, absolutely it does. Uh, you will definitely um, uh, you will it's it's a really good way to learn about form about sculpting form. Somebody was pointing out how cool your sculpt was, and then uh, your screensaver came on. <laughs> yeah, that screensaver, I'm not a fan of. Yeah, I you were just like, saying that last week. Yeah, not because it doesn't show cool stuff, but it's just like you know, it's uh, I find it disorienting. Mm -hmm. You know, and so some of the stuff is so amazing that it's just like, don't show me stuff that's that amazing while I'm working <laughs> on this. You're like, while well, I'm doing this, really. <laughs> Yeah. It just started. What's the difference between Maya and Houdini? There's a lot of differences between Maya and Houdini. Mm -hmm. uh, depends what you want to do. If you want to be an effects artist, then uh, ultimately, I'd say, meaning fire, smoke, demolition, destruction, all that kind of stuff, then get into Houdini. Yeah. Um, because a lot of the big studios are using it for effects. But if you wanted to be like a, you know, not an effects artist, like let's say an animator, then it would make more sense to learn Maya. Or if you want to be a rigger, character rigger, creature rigger, it would make more sense to learn Maya. So it's really about tools have their strengths. You know, Houdini's strength is definitely uh, effects. Although Maya is amazing for effects, Maya can do most things and has plugins for most things. And so that's why Noman are 
curriculum that's kind of split down the middle. So you spend, you take a ton of Maya effects classes and a ton of Houdini effects classes so that you know both, because since they each have strengths, um, you'll see that a lot of pro effects artists um, use more than one tool. Oh, but just... uh, Houdini is awesome for its procedural nature. It's it's way more of, you know, Maya has history, but like history in Maya is really not all that editable, while Houdini, like everything, is in your node history, you know. It's much more of a node-based tool so that you can go back in time a lot much a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So very, very different, but very, very cool. I was just saying that this. I feel like I've sculpted this head before because whenever I sculpt a head without reference, I think it always looks like this. Like, oh, I've made this character before, and then so I went and I pulled open a, a character from a previous stream. It's like it's kind of, it's there's a resemblance there. Probably should have some reference for the next time I sculpt, for sure. Is there any art jam with Pablo Munoz? Gomez, uh, not at the moment, but I've definitely been seeing the work he's been doing, especially with uh, ZBrush guides and um, what's his comic thing? I, I, I followed his comic guide to things, which is cool. Yeah, he just did a edge that's very Mobius looking, which is really cool. Yeah. He posted on Foundation. Mm -hmm. Very cool. But yeah, I would be down to do an art chain with him. He seems like he's doing cool stuff. But he does a lot. Of, he's on the ZBrush Live a lot. So like oh, is he? Definitely, if you want to check out um, Pablo live, I would uh, subscribe to Pixelogic's channel on Twitch and you'll see him there. Yeah, we also host Pixelogic's channel. So you're always welcome at this channel and you can also watch their channel. So either way. Yeah, this definitely will need to get pulled into another direction. Uh, let's see. What I like about using that base though is it's so easy to just make a shape. Like, you're like, okay, I've explored this direction. Maybe I'll continue with it. Maybe I'll, I find it really good for just creating options or just exploring or just sketching. Probably my favorite sketching base mesh. I like what's yeah, going on here. It's, 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 it's really, uh, oh, if you're gonna do something humanoid, I think if, yeah. like, if you don't know what you're gonna do and you start without base mesh, you're gonna make something, you know, humanoid if you don't stretch it as your first step, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Fun one. Let's see. Do it this thing. I was going to show what I did uh, last stream as well. I ended up Finished, not finishing, but I did a little bit more details on this character, which very much turned into Beta Ray Bill, which is kind of intentional, was very intentional. Uh, and then I ended up giving that hammer. I was like, oh, I could do some costume stuff maybe, but Buff Alien Returns. I'm watching uh, Invincible. If you've watched that at all, or if anybody in the chat watches Invincible. Or reads mm -hmm. Invincible. Love the comic. It's one of my favorites, but they just have so many cool creatures and aliens, and it's like this uh, hyper brutal, like the boys style, but animated. Cool. Yeah. It's a good one. Uh, but an art jam with uh, Madeline Spencer. She did one probably nine months ago. She hosted one. Yeah, we could always get Madeline, Madeline mm -hmm. on again. Yeah, that'd be fun. Definitely. CGMA has a six week ZBrush for concept course. Should I attend this or try Madeline's? It's not, again, it depends what you're looking for, I think. So, Madeline also has our Intro to ZBrush series with the Nomen Workshop. So, you know, for 50 bucks, you can get a subscription to the workshop, hang out with Madeline for, I think it's like a 50 hour. Uh, self-guided yeah. intro to the rush yeah as opposed to the live course with noman online which is live so you are you know in there live with maddie with a small group size 
And then obviously you have places that have pre-recorded videos. So it's, there's so many options. It really is a matter of what you're most comfortable with. You know, if you want the live crit and the live feedback to be able to ask questions in the middle of somebody talking, then you want a live class. And that's where, you know, I think that's ultimately the ideal, but it is the most expensive. Mm -hmm. Love the boys. You'll have to check it out. Invincible is one of my favorite comics of a very long time. I have a bunch of them over here. Uh, and they're funny because they all the titles or most of the to titles of the trade paperbacks are named after uh, sitcoms. So this one, it, like they in order, it's like Family Ties, Get Smart, Growing Pains, Happy Days, Who's the Boss, hmm. like Friends, Modern Family, Reboot. Like that's the names of the trades, and it's sort of this like a uh, parody universe, but. Uh, kind of combine it's like a kitchen sink parody universe where everything's in there it's kind of a, it's a fun take on superheroes also it's by robert kirkman so creator of walking dead as well it's his similar like a walking dead is like a similar it's like a, obviously it's a zombie take but it's a slightly different take on zombies yeah. so it's like his take on superheroes so pretty big fan of it i've only seen season one of the walking dead I watched up to like season four or five. I didn't. I haven't continued too much past that. There's so many seasons. There's a I lot. Either, like, oh, maybe I'll, I'll start the Walking Walking Dead. You know, like, and yeah, on yeah. seasons like, oh man. man yeah, there's, awesome. there's a lot. There's a lot, a lot. But uh, I started watching uh, Love uh, Lovecraft Country. Yeah, what do you think? It's really cool. I really I'm liked on it. Episode four, yeah, it's awesome. I really liked that one. Really, really, really cool. It's a lot more violent than I thought. Uh, oh, yeah. A lot of, <laughs> pretty gory. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the story is pretty pretty cool so far. I'm digging mm -hmm. in. Yeah, I like that uh, quite a bit. Into your bachelor's program, do I need <laughs> to formally transfer from a community college? You should talk to admissions for that. Mm -hmm. Admissions can give you all the information for free that, you know. Um, yeah. Anybody who has questions about, you know, Nomen that are admissions related, remember that, you know, our admissions department, they're there to help you at, you know, no charge, consult, look at your work, give you advice, um, tell you about process. It's, you know, they're really, really cool people. They're all artists. Um, so, yeah, I would, that's definitely an admissions question, but don't feel, you know, like you're bugging anybody if you reach out to admissions with a question. Yeah. Save. <laughs> I think I just saved that into a completely random folder. Yep. Dragon Ball movie. Oh, I'm sure that's going to come. Oh, at some point it has to, right? I mean, they have their like their whole universe in the games and all that stuff, but I assume they're talking about live action. Probably. As long as it's better than Avatar, I'll be fine with it. Kind of a live action Avatar, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, let's see. You have to choose yeah. deep. Hmm? I was going to say, have you seen uh, Geo Napkill's new uh, sculpt that he did in Medium? Super cool. Yeah, super cool. Oh, awesome. I haven't done any uh, Adobe Medium work. It seems awesome. Yeah, it seems. I mean, obviously from what he's doing. But yeah. man, that sculpt is so cool. Just that little body in the hands. Yeah, this thing. It's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, not another live action. Oh, I didn't know there was a previous live action. That's interesting. Ooh. Uh, question about ZBrush usability and UI in comparison to market standards. It's very hard to learn. It's not intuitive. What do you think about it? Would you prefer usability or redesign too? Um, that's, that's the thing that I kind of actually like about ZBrush 
is its UI for me. Once I got used to it, uh, it's I actually really enjoy it because it is completely different. It's definitely not up to like the standard of what other programs do, but that's why I think I like it so much is that it feels intuitive once you understand the space. So uh, I don't, I wouldn't, I definitely would not redesign it. Yeah, people have been complaining about the interface of ZBrush since it came out. And I was one of those people when I started learning ZBrush because it was like, why is this so different? Mm -hmm. Blah, 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 blah. Um, but, uh, you know, you'll get used to it. And once you're used to it, you're used to it because it's not actually that bad it, it, once you're used to it and mm -hmm. it is what it is and it's so powerful and it's so awesome that it's worth it you know it, it's right it's, you know yeah you'll complain for a while in the beginning that's normal i did but you know yeah. you just kind of need to get through that because it's such an awesome program and ultimately once you understand the interface um you know then you know it mm -hmm. So, you know, you could say the same thing about Houdini. Yeah, any program that does something like different and has a different methodology and way of working where it doesn't need to follow the standard paradigm, I think yeah. will kind of be unsettling to somebody who has a lot of experience in that space or knows it really well. I quite like it. I mean, I... Uh, I actually found that it's very easy to teach it to people who've never used 3D because it, it is actually quite intuitive. The fact that you can use it, you don't have to know a ton of hotkeys. You don't really have to go through most of the menus. It's just, you know, all in within a couple areas. Uh, it's it's not, not that bad. Only I find it's the people who have used 3D the, that, for a long time that have the biggest issues with it. like it. I think I'm kind of hitting a point where I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. I think I've pushed it just enough that it kind of looks like the vision. Maybe a little bit. Maybe a little Paul Bettany is coming through now. I'm also totally fine with. Am I still working for CIG? No, I'm working for Nomen. And Nomen for almost two years now, I feel like. A year and a half at least. Two years in August. Right. Yep. It's weird because August is coming up. I <laughs> know. It's crazy. Do you think tools like Fusion 360 or more can contribute to speed up the creative process of hard surface modeling not used at all by the industry? Question uh, mark. I think you see some of the concept artists using those especially. People like uh, Vitaly Fausto. and Gavril and Fausto and uh, even Germach and people that use different tools to, to do mostly hard surface shapes are using that quite a bit. I'm also seeing a lot of really cool stuff kind of come out of Blender's box cutter plugin. And I'm seeing a lot of cool stuff even coming out of uh, ZBrush hard surface stuff. Uh, thoughts on Meta Humans by Epic Games. We've talked about this a couple times in streams before, but uh, I think it's cool. I think that there's some great stuff in there. I think it's going to be really great for indie studios, studios that couldn't afford massive character teams to use as background characters or stuff like that. But um, I don't think it's really going to take away too much from the industry. I think it's just going to help projects be more creative on lower budgets. Yeah, it's like with with every development that's happened in regards to software and things that make things easier, uh, the number of artists working in the industry has grown every year for 40 years, you mm -hmm. know, from the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s to today. So the industry continues to grow regardless of the fact that new tools come out that make certain things easier. Um, because the number of visual effects shots in a movie keep increasing the number of mm -hmm. games that come out every year keep increasing the visual fidelity of the games that come out every year are is is increasing and that's because of the tools 
um, getting more intuitive and getting easier to use while the number of artists in the industry is growing. So um, you should never look at developments and software and new tools as something that's going to, you know, necessarily take jobs away. It's just going to change jobs. Um, you know, like you don't have as many people, uh, like the amount of time to do UVs is a lot less now than it used to be because the UV tools have mm -hmm. gotten a lot more intuitive. You know, before ZBrush, sculpting a character was really, really painful mm -hmm. um, because it was all poly by poly. And before that, it was these things called NURBS, which were no fun. Yeah, I think change is good. Good to see that kind of happen. And like I said, I think for you're going to see a lot of indie games probably pick that up. But MetaHumans use Unreal, and it's going to help the production quality of those significantly. Thing. I'm going to move on to something else. Oh, yeah? I don't know. I just don't know what I'm going to do with it. I'm like, I got this head. I got this head. Well, maybe I'll put it on a body. Let's start there. Let's see what kind of things I got. Coming from a UX background, so it's bugging me a lot. I, I feel you, man. <laughs> ZBrush drove me crazy in the beginning. I just was complaining and complaining, like, this is so dumb. Why is it like this? But, you know, it is what it is, and it's it, it really is worth it. So, mm -hmm. but I agree at first. It's like, now I'm used to it, so I don't necessarily see it as, yeah, as an weird. issue. So that's the nice thing is that, you know. Eventually it grows on you. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of just deciding what I want to do. Do I put it on a body? Do I make a body? Just leave it as a sketch, save it for something else. I was uh, listening to... I've been listening to Masterclass, to Neil Gaiman's master, Masterclass on storytelling. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's really good. Really, really good. I mean, I could listen to him just speak for hours. So sometimes I think I'm just zoning out listening to him talk. Uh, but he said something really interesting, which was, um, you know, if you're you're a storyteller, or you're a creator, that you should, that everybody should have a compost heap. And that, you know, like storytelling should have, you, you know, writers should have compost heaps. And what that basically means is it's all your stuff, whether it's uh, sketches you do, it's short writings you do, it's interviews you do, it's ideas or people you meet that you that you think are interesting, you write them down and you kind of put them uh, in your compost heap. And over time, that kind of rots and turns into one thing or several things. And eventually, obviously, you use that that or those pieces as inspiration. Uh, on your projects and that helps it bloom into a beautiful garden or flowers and uh, I thought that was an interesting piece of information because it's like oh like I don't know if I'm going to use this I, I like this head I've clearly sculpted this a couple times before I don't know what I'm going to use it for but maybe right. I'll just save it and put it in my compost heap and then later when I'm like oh I need a head oh I'll start with this like I already have it kind of as like my my uh, reference bin of the types, I guess. So, I don't know. I thought that was an interesting perspective about using using things and ideas in the way that they won't always um, come to fruition, like right when you think about them. So, 
Yeah, I don't know. That was interesting. So this might this might go in the compost heap, which doesn't mean the garbage, doesn't mean the trash. It just means it'll probably be used for something else. But it's kind of fun to just get it out there. I think I'm going to load up that robot. Or maybe I'll make another character that could like live with this. Yeah, I can look up the compost heap. It was on Neil Gaiman's masterclass. Uh, Masterclass was doing something really interesting several months ago. You know, when probably maybe seven, nine months ago, uh, mm -hmm. you could get a membership for a dollar. Oh, a cool. whole year membership for a dollar. So I picked that up and uh, I've just been slowly listening to some of the uh, story and writing and the storytelling side of things. There was a question earlier about what role does storytelling play when applying slash following a Nomen course? Uh, it depends on the course, obviously, but um, you know, if you're doing something like storyboarding or character development or you know, any of the design classes, obviously they play a lot of a heavy goal or a heavy role. And you know, if you're doing modeling or texturing or something like that, understanding what the story is or what story you want to tell with your piece or your image is obviously a big part. So, yeah, yeah I, I think that our our industry begins it's all about storytelling, whether it's mm -hmm. a commercial, video game, movie, TV show, and so the people who are you know the first to create visuals are often the concept artists who are starting with scripts. And they have to make sure that what they're doing is conveying the story, whether it's a character design, a prop, a set. And you know, our students are part of that. And so as a 3D artist, as an effects artist, your job is still to serve the story. And I think that's really where, you know, if you watch something like uh, Ian McKegg's Nomen Workshop series on visual storytelling, that even though he is a known as a character designer, that you know, he's very clear, and all the decisions that he makes all come from thinking first about story. Who is mm -hmm. this character? What is their motivation? Um, why? Uh, and based on the role that they play in the story, what visual language can be used to convey that um, without needing to necessarily know the story? Mm -hmm. You know. And so that's true for lighting and cinematography. And, you know, it's like all of the mediums come together to serve the story in the end. And so since, you know, that's our industry and that's what all of the teachers at Nomen who are all working are all dealing with every day, um, that's going to be conveyed, you know, to the students. Because ultimately, if you're making a decision on in a crit on, on something, uh, especially as students get into higher term in courses like demo reel where that you're working on your final uh, reel then story is a big part of it yeah somebody's asking about tips for sculpting scales like the ones on gators and lizards um sure yeah tips for that there's you can use alphas obviously that the trouble that you'll find with alphas on larger sections of the creatures is when they become more geometric or they follow like a specific pattern like the back of a of an alligator is very square or you'll see those shapes so you can't really just drag alphas on there because you'll start to see the repetition quite a bit um I have sculpted stuff like that and done UVing before. So I would UV the object, create a pattern that matched the scale and the size of what you needed. And uh, then using that as a mask or a displacement map to bump out the initial sculpt. But I find that you kind of always have to um, do another pass, right? You, you kind of have to do another pass or more to, to push that out. Uh, to make it feel more natural. I ended up sculpting a bunch of scales for fish, for a Komodo dragon, for a snake like an anaconda before. Uh, and I used kind of that texture mapping uh, method more so than, than anything else to, to get the pattern. The other challenge you'll find is if you start going scale by scale, which I've also done, uh, it's incredibly tedious, but you might get to the whole coverage and be like, oh, those are too small, or oh, those are too big. Uh, and then you have to sculpt the whole thing 
by hand again, which is a huge pain. So I always try to start with something that's going to be, uh, no pun intended, but sets the scale for your scales, um, for what the size they're going to be before you get moving on it. This was my, uh, for any Invincible fans, this is my battle beast to start. A little subtle call out to Invincible fans, but I love that character. So I, was, I had made this this uh, head the other day during the stream, and I was like, oh, I could make this into a big cat person as well. It was in the most recent episode, so it's like a fan favorite. Are IMM scales good for that? They can be. Um, it's not necessarily yes and no. It really depends on how high detail you want it to be, high resolution you want it to be. Like, you know, if you look at stuff that is, um, I'm trying to think of stuff like, you know, Godzilla is probably going to be a very different thing versus like a small fish that's going to be used in, in a background shot or something like that. The bust of Alex is doing on that body. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> on this body. <laughs> there you go. I'll line them up. I don't know if my guy would be that buff. I don't think so. Thundercats. Oh, that's right. I think they'll probably do a live action Thundercats movie. I feel like they've tried to do several versions if they're not already doing one. Well, that was just announced. That uh, oh, Was it? Yeah. Well, good. That, uh, I forget which director. Maybe the guy who did Godzilla vs. Kong. Some director was just attached to, uh, to that. Mm. Well, there you go. We'll see how ridiculous yeah, this character is. That's been in limbo for a little while. It seems like. Yeah, last week with the director of Godzilla. There we go. I don't think they said anything about when. But yeah. There you go. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm surprised it took them so long since the owners have been outside <laughs> working there. for a while. So, all right, guys. All right. That's right. I was going to load up the Android. Hello from Turkey. Hello. That's far. All right, I'm going to save again. I think I might remesh this guy. Oh, yeah? What are you going to add a body to? Just or? So, no, just so I can subdivide it and start oh, gotcha. stuff. Yeah, scout. Scout. Dude. Puffing and puffing. <laughs> it's like, but wait. Hey now. Hey. Scout. 
Scout. Sorry about that. Dog's got a bark. Trying to hey, find a celebrity. All right, let's see how many polygons we want this to be. Trying to find some of my base meshes. He's just contributing. <laughs> That's all. There's That's something a, to say. Two of them. They're German shepherds. So two big black dogs. All right. Z remesh done. That looks totally fine. Awesome. All right, so divide, divide, divide. Do you ever do the math thing to figure out like oh, how yeah. many polygons the base needs to be so it can end up being your target when you divide it? Yeah, absolutely. You're like, I don't want this to go over too much. Yeah, because like now I just divided it to three, which is annoying yeah. because if I divide again, it's like 12, which isn't ideal. Oh, yeah. Like, eh, I want it to be somewhere around like five or six. Any, anything that goes over like nine for me, seven, seven to nine, feels like it gets a little unworkable sometimes just starts to get slow so i think i'm going to mesh it again the dog was asking for a question <laughs> Like sculpt a dog, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. All right, so this time it's 20. There you go. Now it's subdivided to five. That's better. Feel a little better with that? I feel better about that. Now, project. All right. Yeah, use this base mesh here. This is the one I use all the time. Good. I'm just going to put this body on here. Thanks. Best option for fur? Oh, I don't know. X Gen, maybe. I don't, I don't I do a ton of. Oh. Huh, weird. Heard you Looks for a second. Like, there. Uh, uh, clicking project, I guess, uh, taxes the CPU, so it caused the stream to freeze. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, you're gone for a minute. Uh, yeah, that was just because uh, I was projecting the details. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so now he's 5 million polygons with topology. Perfect. So now I can get rid of that one. Any advice for making UVs less painful? 
uh, well, use UV Master and ZBrush, and you're done with by clicking a button. Yeah, that works. <clears throat> Again, it, de it depends on what you need your UVs to be. So, yeah. like, if you're putting, if you're making a rock like asset that's going to be in the background, then uh, literally using UV Master to auto UV it is fine. Like, the UVs don't need to be perfect on something that's, you know, some background asset with a 1K texture that's never going to be close to camera. Mm -hmm. But when you really need to optimize texture space, that's when being anal about your UC UVs becomes more of an issue. So I think that you want to know how to do perfect UVs. That's important for work, but you don't need to always do perfect UVs. So I've found that, uh, you know, the UV tools in Maya have gotten a lot better and other programs so that automatic UVs are getting a lot easier. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not, you know, I'm not hating UVing as much as I used to. Now I find it to be more of like a Zen thing to do UVs. It doesn't take as long, which is nice. It used to be a much more of a painful operation. I remember um, even like tools like Hedis made it a lot easier. I still have Hedis. Hedis is still works. It's still mm -hmm. cool. What do you use? I use ZBrush. I just use UV Master. Just so fast. Um, it, yeah, it needs to be like perfect. Zero props, yeah, but not other stuff. That's a good rule. Good rule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's like if I was going to take this guy into Maya to do a render of it, um, I'm going to need UVs because I need the normal map or the displacement map. So, but I'll just do auto UVs and ZBrush if I'm just going to be doing, you know, an illustration. But, you know, if this was going to be something that was going to be animated and we were going to be this close to this guy's face um, rendered at 4K, then all of a sudden the UVs get more complicated because this guy might need multiple UV regions. And so the way you de the decision on how to UV it is based on the final output. Yeah. So, but like if this guy was going to be like on a pedestal in the corner of a room and he was going to be this size and frame, then you know auto UV it you know with a 1K map, and you're fine. So I, I would you know, but like when you're a student trying to put together a reel showing like here's a prop I made mm -hmm. that you're doing a turntable of, and you're going to show that you'd also maybe textured it, you're going to want to show the UVs, and modelers are often expected to know how to UV, and therefore from a perspective of getting a job, you want to show good UVs, but that doesn't mean that you're always going to have to do good UVs for work or personal work. Yeah. Utilize your time in a way that you know, represents the final goal. Don't spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours doing something that doesn't need to be that precise. It's good to know how to do it that precisely, but you know, only use it in the places where it needs to be. Right. Way. that's why whenever people ask me for critique really of any kind it's always my first response is always like what's your goal yeah like, is this an illustration is this a print is this a super high res close-up like what's the what's the goal of this because you know there's different ways to do everything and you it really does depend on uh on what your goal is for that I am saving this no longer as head, but as man. <laughs> man one. All right. Uh, man one is going on the compost heap, and we will see when he arrives back on the scene. Uh, let's see. I kind of just want to sculpt a shape now and do a little creature or something. 
Let's do the old sphere. How does that sound? Uh, they want to know if you're in a spaceship. I think your keyboard is signaling to people. <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, being surrounded by stuff is exciting. I mean, obviously, having the setup that Dozer has in the Matrix would be pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's see. I'm kind of blanking on what this creature is going to be. So, chat, I'm going to ask you some questions and see if I can get some inspiration or choices from you. Uh, if I'm going to make a creature, what type of environment should they live in? And should they be a like a predator creature or a prey creature? So, so I got one person that says they live in a tree. It's a good starting point. For some reason I went straight to Pandora or uh, Ferngully. Funhouse. Okay, interesting. Prey, interesting. Let's see. I'm trying to think what I could bring in there. Water, alien swamp, friendly, mossy river, frugivore eats fruit, underwater, underwater. I like underwater. I haven't done underwater in a long time. Maybe that's something I'll try. Lava. Ooh, lava is an interesting idea. I like that. I don't know what that will be, but I like that idea. Clouds. Something that eats trash. Okay. <laughs> it's like a, a scavenger, I think, is what you're going for there. Goblin shark. Oh, good call. None of it. Goblin shark. That's that really gross looking shark. Yeah, the one that has like the alien mouth that like yeah, pops out yeah. of there. Yeah, yeah. Like a raccoon, a compost heap critter. There we go. All right. So we need something that's going to eat and scavenge from the compost heap. Perfect. Per conversation. Some sort of a. I feel like. can run with that. Always underwater scavengers, which is you know, like a shrimp or a lobster. Other things, obviously, but... Alien janitor fish, right? <laughs> Good starting point, yeah. Go quick on this one, but Thank you. 
to usually sculpt with or without reference? Uh, ideally with, especially if I'm working on like a specific project, but when I'm doing jams most of the time, uh, unless I have a clear goal in mind, I don't. I, I know that I should sculpt with more reference, but I'm just kind of searching for shapes sometimes. Uh, yeah, Gio in his post today was saying that he usually is obsessive about reference, but yeah. for the post he did today that he didn't use any and just let himself, you know, uh, yeah. just sculpt out of his imagination. And I think because he sculpts from reference so much, mm -hmm. what he can do from his imagination is amazing because he's absorbed so many forms and shapes over the years. Yeah, that like internal studying, library. Yeah, so I think that, you know, you always have to use reference, um, especially if you're trying to do something you've never done before. Yeah. Um, and if you find yourself doing personal work and repeating yourself, then, you know, using reference is a good way to get out of that. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes what I'll do is like get a point where like I'll, I'll kind of combine those, those styles where it's, you know, all, um, sculpt without reference for a while, get to a point where I'm like, okay, I'm kind of liking this and then do like sort of a research journey of what I like or what it, and, and figure out how it's, how it could work, what, what would work well for that character or creature and, uh, and then go from there. Slothamander, yes, we have, so far we are sculpting a Slothamander. Thank you. Uh -huh. Commander needs some back limbs. Maybe they should live in a tundra. Oh, okay. I don't know if I would have gone for flippers then. Oh, wait. They, they don't like the flippers either. Usually save your files in the cloud or prefer to have a big HDD to store it. Uh, I have a hard drive that I store everything on and then if certain files, if I know I'm gonna work on them somewhere else, I'll uh, put them in the cloud. Yeah, I mean, I work locally. So I'm on an external array. So it's a five drive array. So if one of those drives dies, everything, all the data is still there. And then I uh, back up all the time. How often do you back up? Uh, since I changed location, I'm kind of backing up every time I change location. So mm -hmm. if I'm working on something you know, here and then go to the office to keep working on it, technically I'm backing it up because I'm moving it from one workstation to another. So that's a helpful reason. But I'd say, uh, 
if I'm working on a project, uh, I would back up daily. But that might just mean copying the file to Dropbox or copying mm -hmm. the file to another internal. So like I have my external, but I might draw copy it to a, another external or another, you know, just in case the external were to die. Mm -hmm. So I'm definitely just, you know, paranoid about losing stuff because I have. It sucks. <laughs> it really sucks whenever you lose stuff. Like, well, there goes all that time. Need to figure out the music thing. Yeah, I know. I gotta get some time invested in fixing that out. But I learned that uh, OBS on a Macintosh does not, by default, pick up system sound. Okay. And then, so I was going to use my laptop for that, but now I I went through this long rabbit hole through Reddit of solutions for that. Downloading a program that's supposed to basically cause all that, fix that for you. And uh, yep, it didn't end up working. So I have to figure out from an external source to get some music in here. So I have a big old massive laptop that I might hook up, but it's a real beast of a machine. <laughs> Uh, Jimmy, I, for some reason, while I'm in this chat, I can't click on your link. Otherwise, I would take a look. Uh, the chat program that I have right now uh, will only let me show the link to the audience like this, which is not really what I want. But Jimmy's looking for some feedback. So anybody uh, willing to help, go ahead and take a look there. It's in the Twitch chat. It won't let me copy anything from there or select it. So it just gives me the option to show it. Hello there. Alex is off doing some other stuff, prepping. Sounds like he's got some plumbers at his place. Uh, I'm just kind of sculpting a creature from the chat. It was basically a, what did we go with? It was a water scavenger, I think is what it was. Sculpted things kind of like this in the past, but it's been a while. So I've been enjoying making some shapes.
Vulture Toad. Gag never gets old. I love that one. The things you do to entertain yourself when you're sculpting, making characters. Uh, one of my bosses used to make uh, sound effects almost every time he would do a paint stroke, or at least every couple minutes. Every, every time isn't definitely an exaggeration, but he would do a. He would always be making noises whenever he was sculpting or painting. It was like, and then sometimes he would try to get into the voice of whatever the character was. So it would be like, you know, making noises like the creatures would make. Just kind of fun. If you didn't know him, like from out of nowhere, you would just hear these like. <laughs> you would just hear these creature noises or animal noises or robot noises and uh it was uh off putting the first couple of times you you met him and worked with him, but then eventually you're like, Oh, okay. I see. Mash this back into the foot. I can smooth it out, and then if I dynamesh it, it'll probably go away. Yeah. Where to, let's see, do I have any tips to come up with creatures? Because every time you do, your ideas just go away. Um... Try to get them out as fast as possible. If your ideas are going away, just try to get them out as fast as possible. Um, if your ideas are like going away while you're working on the creature, I guess, you just can't push it forward. Maybe that's where reference comes in. You know, Maybe having some additional jumping off point would be a, a good thing to do. Uh, work in your silhouette quite a bit. So if I put this all the way to black, here I'll, yeah, that's always helpful. That didn't do anything, did it? Why? There we go. Work in silhouette. It's a really easy way to kind of keep focusing on your overall shape versus like what you're actually working on. That dude looks cool. He's just leaving through the air. Yeah. That's the move. All right. Where's my Wacom pen? I used to have one of those um, like glass tops, like glass desktop with like the black underneath the, the so it was like all glass, black mirror look. And I loved mm -hmm. the way it looked. But I would always lose Wacom pens on them. Like it would be right in front of me. And I'd be like, where? Especially in the dark, just like patting my hands like to try to find the pen. So many times I've lost it. Uh, let's see. How to start building a model in ZBrush? Uh, there's so many different ways. You can use a base mesh. You can use Z spheres. You can use Dynamesh and kind of just pull out things from here, which is what I did with this character. Um, there's so many different ways you can make a character. It's really difficult to uh, to to say. Uh, do I do a lot of hard surface modeling in ZBrush? I do. Most of what I do or or have done in the past is. Uh, creating sketches of characters or proportions and you know figuring out where the design is going to go and then I would poly model it in uh, Maya or some of the program uh, to finish it 
and then sometimes take it back into ZBrush to finalize that sculpt. Uh, I haven't done that in quite a long time, though. Um, I have been playing around more with the like uh, hard surface specific stuff inside of ZBrush, and I find that that's pretty cool. Like I'm enjoying doing that. I definitely want to to do that more. Uh, let me see if I can find a thing that I'm looking for. Here we go. We'll see if this model loads up. I'll show you some of the older hard surface stuff I did. That would be kind of a nice example for stuff that's in ZBrush and ZBrush and another program to show you that kind of uh, style. So this is a character that I did many years ago, but I ended up doing it actually for a workshop title uh, when it loads. This was a, a character that I did. I'll pull this so you can see full screen a little better. There we go. Hide this graphic. Put on this graphic. Uh, so this character I made out of many different pieces. I ended up sculpting the whole character once as a single or a couple sub tools to understand what the, the relationships of the shapes would be. And then I went into Maya and I retopologize. So this is right here, the lowest subdivision. I uh, retopologize each piece, sculpted in some of the details that I knew that I would want in that. But then like you'll see, uh, this one is polymodeled in. Whereas the this one right here, this one above the nose bridge is not necessarily poly modeled in. So I would sculpt in some areas and I would also um, model in some areas depending on what was needed. So you see like here in the nose bridge, uh, this is all ZBrush sculpted while the rest of it is like this is poly modeled to hold different edges and stuff. So it really depends. Uh, I've done a lot of this type of stuff all different kinds of things so you can see even like the details in this chest piece this is like a sculpted line while some of this is more of a polymodeled line so different workflows for sure for different uh, types of things do i not like the zebra silhouette thumbnail that ships with it now uh, it's fine it's just i don't like having it up all the time like, and uh, if you hit the letter V on your keyboard, uh, it'll actually just switch between your two colors right here. So if this is your primary color and this is your secondary color, it switches them. And if you're using a matte cap, if you're using a different material, like let's say I use this toy plastic and I hit V, it'll switch it to black, but you'll see that it's actually using any of the standard materials. Um, they have reflective capabilities, so they, they don't go fully to black. Whereas if you're using a, a matte cap, which I prefer to use, it'll automatically switch it to silhouette. And so for me, that's just a faster, bigger way to see what I'm wanting uh, versus this. So it's fine that this thing's fine. I just already have something like that at my disposal pretty easily. Uh, you really like the Iron Man that I did? Did I do that in Maya? Yes. Uh, pretty much all of the uh, Iron Man models that I did were in Maya. I did use ZBrush to block out proportions, meaning like I would bring in this shape and to understand how long the bicep would be, where certain uh, design lines and rhythms would be. Uh, but most of the actual modeling itself was was done in Maya. Yeah. Uh, how did I meet Alex? Was I a Nomen student once? Yes, I was. I was a Nomen student in 2008 and 2009. Uh, so I, I went through the, the two-year program uh, a, a decade ago. Hmm. It was a while ago, but I still remember you as a student in demo reel really well. That's good. I, I, I think. When we did that... Uh, Everybody make something and you made that pumpkin head. Yeah, I made a pumpkin pig or something like that. Yeah. I was just like, damn, that was fast. That was good. <laughs> so like, like I was uh, definitely impressed with you when you were a student. Yeah, I definitely remember that class really well because I, I think I said it last week on the stream, but that was probably one of my biggest. I had like a couple good successes in that in that class. I also had probably some of my biggest failures at Nomen in that class too, because I was like, "I'll try something different," and it was like, "Oh no, 
this, this is not going the way I expected it to. It's just weird funny. how long ago that is. Mm -hmm. Wondering how I made those smooth and clean lines in ZBrush. Any tips? Uh, yeah, Lazy Mouse. Lazy Mouse is absolutely the way to do that. Uh, I'll just show you on this piece here, I guess. I guess I'll go back to this mode so you can kind of see what's there. Um, if you go into your stroke options and you hit Lazy Mouse, which is right here, uh, I'll just tear this off so we can see it. Uh, you need to adjust your lazy radius. So I'll crank this number really high up. Usually I use it somewhere around 70. And what that does, it, it is individual per brush. So make sure you're, it's on the brush you want it to be. Uh, some brushes will have it on by default and they'll put the, the radius at, at zero or at one. Uh, and that's just kind of a different thing. But if I turn this off, what you'll see, if I try to do, I'll try to mimic like this uh, line that I have this line here. So if I try to draw this now, you'll see that it's, you know, this is without lazy mouse. It's really difficult. I'm trying to be uh, controlled, but it's, it's tough to get that shape. Whereas if you turn on lazy mouse, you crank this radius above 40 or 50. Uh, what you'll notice is as I draw, there's this line that you can see, like a red uh, line that goes here. And even though the, the cursor is moving, the uh, stroke is not actually happening yet until I extend that beyond a certain number. And that's what this lazy radius number is. So if I crank this up really high, you'll see how long that red line goes. It basically works like a piece of string. So you can, you're you setting the length of string, and as you pull it, it won't create the stroke until the length of the string is hit, and then it will begin to pull that. What is great about it, I'll turn it down just a little bit, is that I'm going to be extreme here, so I'm going to move my cursor back and forth like this. But you'll see, even when I'm going like this, all the way down here, uh, it's not having an extreme amount of influence on the stroke. So if I dial this down somewhere around 75, and then I'll turn my intensity down to somewhere around 35, uh, draw size down, and I go somewhat slow. You can see how you can kind of create. Uh, also, is because there's my cursor is still down. You can create really sharp angles in your design this way because you have so much control. So you can do something that's got a more um, intentional kind of a feel to it when you when you use lazy mouse in that way. Uh, you can go with large strokes too you know like if i wanted to do something that was fast you can do that as well but uh to get those types of of lines where they connect and you want it to feel nice and clean um lazy mouse is definitely the way to go you could do it in z modeler now probably if you wanted to do something like a poly group or group by poly group uh it's a really good tool but lazy mouse is the the number one one that i use uh, and there's also a uh where is it snap I think it is. Yeah, I think it, it snaps to the end of a previously drawn stroke. So we'll turn that up a little bit. We'll see what happens. Uh, we'll make a stroke here. I think if you turn this up, you'll see that it it actually is dialed in to the, the previous stroke that I did. And I can kind of continue. So even if I want to lift my pin up, if I have lazy snap on, uh, it can kind of pick that last point a little bit or maybe more. I'm not being super accurate right now, but you'll see how it's kind of starting to pick up where the previous stroke was. So you can use it in a way so you can rotate the camera uh, versus just doing it in one shot, which is much, much more challenging. So yeah, that's the way that uh, I've done those these types of lines before. And honestly, just a slow like 
slow approach, you know, slower than you think you need to go is going to get you where you need to go as well. I, I think you don't need to be confused about doing everything fast, like a slow, you know, paint stroke across is going to give you what you want in one shot rather than trying to be sketchy and do it, you know, in 10 or 15 different uh, attempts. Oh, I still have Lazy Mouse on, though. Let's get that out of there. Yeah, taking your time with stuff is important. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about how fast people really are. Yeah. You know, like you see these <clears throat> live streams or things like the ZBrush Summit, the Sculpt Off. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people who like, like plan that out and actually like they get the theme in advance, mm -hmm. you know, and like they'll actually run through it a couple times. Like, you know, and yeah, there are some people that are insanely fast, but you know, like I'm not super fast and um, I think it's rad some people who are, but don't psych yourself out. Just take There's the no time. need to. Yeah. It's like, take the time. I mean, once you have a job, you'll have a deadline and you'll know how long, you know, you were given and then that's how long, you know, things are only as good as they can be by the time it's due. Mm -hmm. Speed is important, but I think as a student, it's very difficult to be fast and I wouldn't worry about it too much. Yeah, definitely not important when you're a student. I think going through the process is far more important, you know, going through it and you don't have to speed through it, making sure you're understanding or at least pushing through the the challenging points of the process is more important than saying how quickly you got through it. You know, like being able to learn it far more important than speed. And even like on what I'm doing now, like I'm making a little creature in an hour or so, but this is nowhere near what I would put like as a final creature for anything. Like I would be spending hours and hours and hours detailing this thing, finalizing the, you know, the sculpt or whatever. So it's just cause you can make a sketch in a couple hours. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's done or doesn't mean that it's up to like, a, you know, the high, uh, the high lo level that you would want it to be done for a, a production or something like that. So I think there is that misconception. It also doesn't account for feedback and notes, which is a huge, huge portion of the industry. Like, even if you could create something as fast as whatever, it still needs to get notes and somebody's going to say what they like about it or what they don't like about it. And that's uh, yeah. that adds kind of invisible time that I think a lot of people aren't uh, really aware of. Good night, whoever's in Amsterdam. Yeah. They're probably nine hours ahead of us. Eight or nine, yeah. That's a place I'd like to go to again. I went to Amsterdam like 20 years ago. Yeah. Really cool, but went there for a massive black workshop. Oh, cool. It was the first massive black workshop, and it was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> It was fun. Yeah. Of but like course. it was the first one. So like nothing worked. Projectors didn't yeah, yeah. work. 
but uh, but it was pretty entertaining. I'd like to go back as well. It's a cool place. Things from the Czech Republic. Hello. It's got to be late or early there, too. I love Prague. Been there twice. Yeah? Oh, my God. Prague is so rad. Just walking around there, just there are so many churches and cemeteries and things I love. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's really uh, – I spent, like, three weeks there. And uh, really, really loved it. a.m. Night Owl. Yeah. Good for you. That was me for a long time. Same, yeah. I kind of miss it. I do, too. I was thinking, talking about that, that uh, somebody else the other day. I was like, I can't even sleep in past seven anymore. <laughs> I know, Body wakes me up every single day. Yeah, same. I mean, I'm also not going to bed as late as I used to. So I used to like basically, if I could see that it was starting to get light outside, it was like, oh, yeah, it's time. To yeah. Bed. It's time. Yeah. Be a night owl when no one's live streaming. That's true. Yeah, that's true. For you, for your time zone, unfortunately. Yeah, it's tough to pick a time zone that like works for everybody. Mm -hmm. But I think this afternoon time zone seems to be working, or time slot seems to be working okay. Yeah. It's weird when the brush decides to like do those huge strokes. You the one that like goes all the way up the, across the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes like pressure sensitivity just stops working. Mm -hmm. And that one happens to me quite a bit, actually. So I sometimes have to just, what always works for me or almost always works for me is just like minimizing the program with my pen, clicking on mm -hmm. anything else and then coming back and seeing if that works. All right. All right. Oh, that worked. There we go. <laughs> it's like it just needed a break from you. That's all. My drinks are empty. Oh, wait, I got one more. It's like try and prep for the live stream by having at least a couple. Mine are all half full, which means they're all lukewarm at this point. I didn't I didn't go in the proper order. Bucket of ice, I guess, is the <laughs> for next time. Yeah. All right. 
Are we doing on time? Four twenty. We have, yeah, we have uh, forty minutes left. Hmm. I'm pretty good about this little creature for now. I think that's probably as I might do some paint over on it or something, but I feel like it needs a push. Normally, I would, what I end up doing on stuff like this is I actually take a break. So I actually enjoy working on a couple projects at once. And so what I'll do mm -hmm. or often do is just like, okay, give myself like a visual break or like a little breather and then come back to it with kind of fresh eyes and be like, what do I like about this? What do I not like about this? To kind of let it soak in. It work though. Weird. My, uh, I just full screened our stream software and then unfull screened it, and uh, now all the chat that, that I had was gone. It's weird. Yeah. It's the first time I've ever seen that happen. It's one twenty in Spain. Oh my god, I'd love to be in Spain. Spain <laughs> yeah, Spain is amazing. Also, you were saying that I've never been there. I've only been to Madrid and Barcelona. Um, Madrid a couple times, um, Barcelona once, and uh, I really want to go back. I have I have a family in Madrid now. Uh, mm. A lot of family have left Venezuela because Venezuela is a mess, mm -hmm. and so uh, and gone to Madrid, some. And uh, but yeah, it's just the food's great, the atmosphere is great, the people are cool, it's beautiful. Blade Renard, are you in France? Are you in France? Because France is also amazing. Mm -hmm. France, I've been to many, many times because I grew up grew up going there every summer to visit family because I'm half mm -hmm. French. Uh, what am I doing? I'm spacing out. Um, yeah, it says yeah, they're from France. Cool. And I've been to Portugal for THU, the Trojan Horse oh, event. Yeah. Lisbon. Lisbon's great. Got to spend to time that one. Been after the events. What was that? I didn't get to go to that one. I went to the Malta one. Uh, yeah, I went to the Lisbon one twice. And uh, it was really, really cool. All right, I'm going to delete this piece. Yes. Geometry. All right, cool. Yeah, I can't wait to be able to travel again. Oh, yeah. Where's the first place you're going to go once you can travel? Me? Mm -hmm. uh, overseas, I would like to go to, I don't know, a place we went to a, lot, a couple of years ago that I would really love to go back to is to go back to Tokyo. Uh, yeah, Tokyo is very, very cool. Mm -hmm. I went to Tokyo with Kristen Birschbach. Oh yeah, twenty, well, twenty years ago, I guess. Mm -hmm. For a uh, got invited by a, like an art school there, 
mm -hmm. to do a couple demos and that's gi days i had to do a demo in front of like 150 people or students and i got there and the silicon graphics workstation was running the japanese version of irix which was the operating <laughs> system so everything uh -huh. was in japanese and i had to mount my hard drive <laughs> and uh none of they didn't have a tech person so right. i had to figure out how to get to like the system settings to mount my hard drive on a japanese uh, how just through like kind of remembering where it was yeah. by like oh it's like go here up five right two down one i think <laughs> is kind of where i finally yeah. got it to mount which was amazing but i was yeah. super stressed out because like the clock was ticking and the event was about to start and i couldn't do anything if i didn't mount my hard drive yeah you're like and i'm gonna be screwed here and never yeah if i can't figure this out i have never been to slovenia yeah yeah like while i'm very lucky to have been a lot of places there's obviously a uh, way many more places i haven't been and you know it's like and the thing that's awesome like part of you know because of being in this industry and and uh, nomen it's like i've a lot, a lot of the traveling i've done has been uh, for free because you go to events and they pay for your plane ticket so right. you know it's uh like i went to japan uh and uh, yeah, everything was paid for. It's like hotel, airfare, like, so like once you get to a point that, you know, you are working in the industry, like putting, throwing your name in the hat for events, you know, is worth doing. Cause you know, you never know when they're gonna say, okay, and invite you. And mm -hmm. then you get to meet cool people, you get to travel and it's free, you know, like uh, most events don't pay you, meaning right. they'll just pay for the airfare and the, and the hotel. Um, but uh, man, I've been to so many cool places um thanks to that yeah all right so now let's see if i can remember You're looking for I'm remembering how to use UV master because it's been a second <laughs> yes so, okay work on enable control painting uh, attract scenes all right I want the seams on the back if possible All right, so I want the seam on the back. It's symmetrical. I painted that. I'm working on a clone. I'm going to click unwrap. Cross my fingers. Did it do it? Or is it thinking? It's doing it. It was doing right. something. <laughs> all right it did it check seams Ugh. Ooh, right in the middle of the face <laughs> that's not the one you want yeah all right that's not what i wanted so now attraction is still on the back protect Let's try and not get seams right there. Anywhere but there. And let's try that again. Your head looks like a naked mole rat. Yes, that was definitely some of the subconscious inspiration i guess it was sort of that 
mixed with the the squirrel thing from Ice Age. Did it work? It did a much better job, but I'm going to just bring this protection down a little further. I mean, I'd really like to not have a seam anywhere on the neck. All right, it's better. I'll accept that. So copy UVs. Paste you these. All right. Does he have UVs? He does. And there hey. you go. UV master. <laughs> you are officially UV master. Yeah. I mean, ideally, I wouldn't have that seam going up the middle of the head up there, but. Yeah. All right, and then now this guy, Estive one. Work on a clone. Enable control, attract. Uh, yes, it is now UV. Basically, he's UVing all those pieces with UV Master, which is a cool plugin for uh, for ZBrush, where you can basically UV stuff super, super quickly. Uh, and it'll you can tell it areas. You don't have a, a ton of precise control, but you can tell it, tell it areas where you want seems to be, or you want them to protect and avoid those certain areas. So that's what uh, some of the mm -hmm. control painting that he's doing right now is. Yeah. So uh, if I paint in really red, quick. yeah. So I, like if I paint here in red. I'm saying don't put any UV seams there. Mm -hmm. And then I can just click that unwrap button again. So, so you can see I'm not like doing any UV shell stuff or moving individual points around. I'm just letting ZBrush do it. And then I can check where the seams went. So this one is better because the seams are on the back. And, uh, and that looks fine. So I'm now going to just click Copy UVs go back to my the correct one, which is this one, paste the UVs onto this one because I'm just working on a clone, meaning a copy. And then I can check that it has UVs by just throwing one of ZBrush's default maps on it. And then if I go to the subtool for the head and do the same thing, then I can see that it's got UVs, meaning that you know textures are able to wrap around it. Um, so for something that's just you know quick, just so I have UVs so I can get this thing over to Maya, um, this is totally fine. And again, if this was like a prop in the background, then this would be kind of probably fine too. Mm -hmm. um, if I was going to really try and UV the, this the way I would want that head, I, I would definitely not have that seam going up the middle on that. I could always redo it in ZBrush, but mm -hmm. I'm fine with it for now. Maybe. Starting to bother you, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, mm, I'm not sure I like that anymore. So this is this one. So <clears throat> nice thing is I can quickly just, since it's on a clone, and the clone is another Z tool, I can still go back to this clone and adjust the seams. Right. Um, And so I was protecting here. And now I can be like, well, maybe that seam that was going up the middle is bugging me. 
and see if ZBrush is able to UV this without a, a seam there. And then uh, we'll see. How often would I use UV Master over Maya's UV tools? Um, hmm, that is not necessarily better. <laughs> um, I will. I will always use. I'll often use both. Meaning, I might use UV Master to just get it started, and then adjust the shells in Maya. Um, it kind of depends. So, I think if I'm doing something that again is not a hero asset that's up close, then I'll just use UV Master. But if it's something that's going to be up close and I'm going to want to be specific, I probably just do it myself and, and with Maya's UV tools. So it's really has to do with how close the camera it is and how high res the texture is going to be and whether I'm worried about seams. Um, but generally, if I know like how this is going to look to camera, I'll try and put the seams on the side that the camera doesn't see. And that's basically, you know, how you're going to look at seam placement is how can you put the seams in the place that's most likely not to be seen by camera so like this isn't good because i had one seam down the middle now i have two down the front there so i don't really like the way it did at that time But it is, you know, it's a little hit and miss with UV Master as far as where it is going to put the seams. And so that's what's nice if you're using Maya's tools. You can be very, very specific um, as to where the seams are going to go. And I'm sure there's tools out there now for UVs that are probably, you know, even better than, let's say, UV Master or Maya's, like a third party tool like Hedis. Um, I just don't do a lot of UVs. So I'm not aware of what, like, the current, you know, state of the art UV tool might be because things keep changing. Mm -hmm. But if I was going to like get into a project that required like a lot of UVs, I'd probably ask a friend like who does it a lot and just find out like, you know, what is the thing I should be using, you know, um, because that's the great thing is once you have friends who work in the industry, then, uh, you know, it's a good way to get quick answers because somebody who's you know working professionally as a modeler is probably going to know what the fastest UV tool is. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, see, I still got that seam on the front. One last time. Just like this. Don't uh, give me one. I can see. <laughs> uh, did you Z remesh that? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, Goosebumps in chat is asking if it was planned to be retopped, but since he already did uh, Z remesh, he doesn't really, and it doesn't you know, need to be super high fidelity topology. It's kind of already achieving what he needs. Dun, dun, dun. That's better. There you go. Look at that. No seams from the front at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little one from the side. They're on the back. See, now we're getting to where I'd probably put them if I did it myself. Yeah. Pretty awesome. Copy UVs. Is this the one? Yeah. Amazing. All right. Save. <laughs> I guess I should save that, yeah. Um, so yeah, so now he's UV so he's retopped and uh UV'd. 
So if I go and look at this guy at like his level one, then you can see what the topology looks like. And so that's just topology from ZBrush. So just the fact that it's a one button solution to retopologize this guy mm -hmm. and then a few button clicks to UV it is an example of something that, you know, just saves so much time. Oh my mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. you know, so awesome. And uh, so, yeah, so now um, I could send him over to Maya. Um, although we only have 15 minutes, but yeah. If I'm in a hurry or there's something that's like something that's uh, also like a background asset, often I'll just like decimate, mm -hmm. and not worry about normal maps and displacement maps and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, let's get him. Yeah. Another thing is I have no idea. Like I usually or often will start with something that like the scale is set in Maya and then bring it over. So I'm curious how that uh, planar head that we started with. Oh yeah, how big it is. Wow. Yeah, that's a good question. I actually don't know. I don't. I haven't brought it into Maya in, in a long time, from what I recall. So uh, well, we're about to find out. So <laughs> I'm going to export the level one of the head. So export. Projects, ArtJam, data from ZRush. And this is going to be the head SDIV1. And then I'm going to go to his other thing, go to the SDIV1, export that. And that is whatever this is, body. And we can see what scale this stuff comes into Maya. Oops, that's not what I want. Let's see how big it is or small. Maya's uh, lost thinking about it. I don't know what. Is it thinking about the output window? Now, supposedly Maya, I haven't installed Maya 2022 yet. Mm -hmm. but supposedly they fixed that thing where it like loads the interface, but you can't interact with it. Oh, for right. Yeah. A minute or two. Supposedly 2022 doesn't do that anyway anymore. Yeah. Meaning that the load screen just stays longer. I have a feeling. Uh. You know, like <laughs> they just don't, like it still probably takes the same amount of time. Yeah. 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 You just don't have this like whatever you would call it. All right, file, import. And so ArtJam, data from ZBrush. And there it is. So how big are you going to be? Don't even see it. Where Incredibly is it? Incredibly small. Oh, okay. It, oh, it's tiny. How small is that in your scene? Uh, this... My scene, like my layout scene that I yeah. have on the shelf that I load, this is a six foot tall person or like 180 centimeters. Okay. Yeah. And so you can see it's, it's like coming in as a tiny 3D print. Yeah, absolutely. I was gonna say it's life size for me. That's what I <laughs> that's what I would want. Yeah. Uh, that's funny that they would have the default. I mean, they don't, they don't think about scale. Yeah. So grab this, uh, import that. All right, so now I've got both of those. So as I might go back and forth between Maya and ZBrush, I'm just I'm not gonna just move and scale these things. I'm gonna group them together so I can then move and scale the group so I can mm -hmm. easily import like another edited version and just know how they need to be moved. Let's scale this guy so that he's roughly normal scale. Like if he was six feet tall, his head would be up that big. There he is in Maya. Mm -hmm. and so now give him some shaders. So I'm going to create a new material for the head, which is going to be a redshift material. And then I'll create a new material for that, which will also be a redshift material. So this one I will call head underscore redshift. 
And this one will be body underscore redshift. And then I'm going to change my aspect ratio. So instead of rendering it horizontally, I'll just do, let's say, just pick a vertical aspect ratio. So display options. So this is four by five, which is the standard resolution aspect ratio for Instagram, mm -hmm. which is weird, but it is. Yep, four by five's really come on the scene in the past like year or two. Uh, yeah, it's like if you want to maximize space on Instagram, four by five is is the size to go for. Yeah, and then my camera's got too much perspective distortion on it, so I'm just going to increase the focal length on my camera. So not so there's not so much perspective distortion on this dude. And then save. Yeah, of course. Can't forget to save. Nope. Uh, oh, so, okay. while you are saving, uh, anybody that's watching, uh, we got about 10 minutes left. So I want to just kind of shout out for a couple things uh, before we end up wrapping up here. Uh, we have some cool events coming on next week. We'll be doing our art jam with uh, Alex, myself, and Dave Neal. Uh, he did a Noman Workshop title somewhat recently on some 2D characters. So he'll be joining in. Uh, as well to jam. I think he'll probably be doing some work in 2D, so that'll be cool. Uh, and then that'll be uh, on the 21st of April, and then on the 22nd of April, we'll be doing a animatics for indie filmmakers in Unreal Engine. So Miguel Ortega and Tran Ma, uh, who are two Nomen instructors, uh, went through the Unreal Fellowship, and they uh, are going to show off some of the stuff that they did in, in that. Uh, which should be a pretty cool one. I'll definitely be checking that one out. So uh, like and subscribe. Anything that you're you're currently streaming or watching us on so you can get notifications for that, but also um, follow us on social or sign up for the event brights if you're specifically looking for these. So the art jam next week and indie filmmakers with unreal. That all sounds awesome. Yeah. I'm excited to have a, another guest on and, and a 2d guest this time. Yeah, that's uh Super cool. Think you're going to do 2D? No, definitely not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I might do some paint overs, and maybe that's what I'll do. It's a good time for me to get something set up to paint over, uh, whether I'm doing a final render or whether I'm doing some uh, explorations on, like, you know, furthering design explorations. Are you? I might. Thinking about it? Thinking about it. I love that you have that stream, like, or that scene just set up so that you can quickly check things. Uh, yeah, it's just so I don't have to set up the physical sun and sky and all that stuff every time. Yeah, it's just kind of tedious. Because you know you want it to begin with, so it's just get it out of the way as a scene. I love that. Nice little rim light. I dig that. Yeah, although I think he needs to let's see. Close that, save. The skeleton in here, real quick, just mm -hmm. so I can just so I can pose the head. Rigging, skin, skeleton, create joints, joint, joint, joint. Uh, let's go back on that one. Let's put that one there. 
that one there. How many uh, joints are you making? Just a couple? Uh, just a couple. Mm -hmm. yeah. Although, I think I'm going to go add another joint. So, now that I'm thinking about it, instead of rushing, create joints. One there, one there, there, one there, one there. Okay. Skin, bind the skin, same settings. And we'll see if we get an okay result. I'm sure it'll need some fixing. All right, so perspective. And then name the joint to make life easier. So that is the head joint. That's the neck joint. And then paint skin weights. And then replace with a value of one. Basically, anything that is attached to the skull mm -hmm. needs to move 100% with the head joint just gets painted white. Which includes his little breast. Whatever. down the B key to change the size of that brush. And then that should be good. I'm just now need to smooth it. So I'm just going to go to smooth and click flood which kind of blurs the weighting. Does Maya have symmetry weight painting? Not while you're painting. So hmm. you just paint one side, and then there's a copy or mirror skin weights tool. And then now that that's like that, so now if I grab the head joint, it should look better. Yeah, there we go. There you go. Thanks. So now, he turned his head. Well done. Nice and easy. Nice and easy. So if I go back to the shot cam. Ooh, I kind of like that pose here. there. It's kind of the look into the side was kind of cool. Yeah. Well, I can also just go in here and make an animation. Yeah. Go to 300 frames and just be like, there. And then play. <laughs> but I'm not going to use any of that. So delete. So <laughs> yeah, just to show that you could do it. Yeah. Yeah. I just the reason I rigged it was just so like if I want to just slightly pose the head for right. 
list, then at least I, I can. But hopefully that showed people how, you know, in the end, it can go pretty fast as long as you, I mean, I just drew a skeleton and did some basic waiting. Mm -hmm. Waiting a whole body is tedious, but waiting just a head is actually something that can go pretty fast. And then what's cool is I can have the render view up. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna hit save so that I can just, you know, adjust the pose. Yep, and see the final and result. The render will update. Awesome. Well, yeah. we are okay. almost out of time. We got one minute left. Time. Yeah. Pretty good jam. I like your character. I like that you rigged it up and got a quick shot of it, too. Oh, your dude looks awesome. You made, again, an entire creature. That's amazing. All low res, but enough to get the idea out. So, you know, it works. I, I, I kind of like just making quick things and this... Uh, I feel like this idea of the compost heap feels much more like I'm not throwing things away, that like I'm going to put them in a place that I'm like, okay, this will come back later. I know it will. I just got to figure out what I'm going to use it for. So, yeah, that's and right. Making some stuff like this feels fun. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today on the jam. I uh, hope you all had fun. And uh, like I said, we'll be doing some cool stuff next week. We don't have any more events the rest of this week, uh, but like and subscribe on whatever uh, platform you're on for the art jam next week with Dave Neal. And then we have the uh, Unreal for Indie Filmmakers, which talks about the Unreal Fellowship that Miguel Ortega and Tran Ma went through. Uh, it's going to be next Thursday. And then I just saw that we'll be having a event with Sonia Kristoff that Friday. So not this oh, Friday, awesome. but next Friday. Uh, she's going to be talking about some of her work she's been doing in Blender. So if you're interested in seeing any of the Blender work that she's been doing, check that out on Friday. Art Jam on Wednesday and then Thursday is the Unreal Fellowship. So thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, Alex, was good jam. Good to, good to chat. Yeah. Good to work. Totally. Stuff. All right, everyone. We will see you all next week. Have a good one.